Hi, I'm Michael Correa, and this is Psych Exam Review. In this video, I'm going to explain how color vision works. Now, an important thing to begin is that color is not actually in light, and it's not really in objects either. So, for instance, if we look at, you know, this coaster here, and we might say it's tempting to say that the cloth is red, right? But it's not really red. All, all that we're really saying is that the cloth reflects wavelengths of light that we perceive as being red. So it's not really the case that the cloth is red, and it's not even really the case that the light that's reflected is red. It's just that the light that's reflected is a particular wavelength that we perceive as being red. Okay, and that brings up the point that there's a lot of light that we don't perceive. We aren't able to see light that's in uh, certain wavelengths. There's actually a very narrow uh, range of wavelengths that we're able to see. This is the visible spectrum of light, and any light that's has a larger or smaller wavelength, we're not able to see, even though it is still there. So here's a, a chart demonstrating this. So this just shows this sort of spectrum of light waves, and we can see there's very large waves, like radio waves, which are like the size of large buildings, and, uh, you know, we don't see these when they're, you know, they're all around us, but we can't see them. Uh, the same is true for things like microwaves. So when you cook food in your microwave, you're using light to cook the food, but you can't see it. Right? You can't see it. It looks like the food is just sort of magically cooking. Uh, but that's just because you can't see the microwaves that are bombarding uh, the food. Uh, then when you get a little smaller, we get to infrared. Um, and we can't see infrared light. Uh, and then finally we get to the visible spectrum. And it's a pretty narrow uh, section where uh, we have you know, red, if you're familiar with the uh, mnemonic Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, uh, green, blue, indigo, violet. That's the order of the spectrum from longest frequencies that we can see to shortest. And then once we get shorter than violet, we get to ultraviolet, which we can't see. Um, although actually some animals can see, birds and bees can see ultraviolet light. So, you know, there could be ultraviolet light that we wouldn't perceive anything, but they would be able to see it. And there's some rare cases of people who can see ultraviolet light. Uh, but these are people who have usually had surgery to their eyes. They've had a um, surgery on their cornea or on their lens and in some cases, this results in them being able to perceive some ultraviolet light, and it's actually uh, not like a superpower. It's really annoying for them, and it distorts their color vision as well. Um, but that's an exception. Most people can't see ultraviolet light. And then, of course, we can't see X-rays and gamma rays and, and even smaller wavelengths of light. Okay, so within this visible spectrum, uh, we can see certain types of light. And actually, I want to show you a demonstration of infrared. Uh, so we can't see infrared light, but we can create devices that would convert infrared light into visible light. And in fact, you have one of these in your house right now uh, if you have a remote control. So remote controls communicate using infrared light. And that's why you don't see anything coming out when you push the button. You don't see any light going towards the TV. Uh, but there is light being emitted. Uh, and actually, there is a way that you can see it. So you'll have to take my word for this because this only really works in person. I can't actually do this demonstration via camera. Uh, so when I look at this uh, remote, if I press a button, I don't see anything, right? There's no light. It doesn't light up or anything. It's just emitting infrared light waves, and I can't see them. But if I point it at the camera, you can actually perceive them. Because what's happening is my camera on my computer is able to pick up some infrared light, and it sort of accidentally converts that into visible light, and that allows you to see it. So you have to take my word for it that I can't see it now, uh, but you can see it on the camera. It looks like I'm turning on a flashlight. And you can try this yourself if you have a remote, and then just look at it through the camera of your phone. That will also pick up some infrared. Uh, and you can see that. And that's essentially how night vision works, right? It, it allows you to put on some goggles that sense the, the infrared light that we can't normally see, and they convert it into the visible spectrum, and then you're able to see it. Okay, so let's get back to color. All right, so uh, we have these different frequencies we can see, and what happens is we sort of divide them up. We see them as different colors, uh, and that's our perception, right? That's happening in our mind. It's not actually, they're just different wavelengths of light. Okay, so the question is, well, how do we do this process of, of categorizing these different wavelengths into different colors? And so one of the first people to propose a theory of this was a British polymath named Thomas Young. And uh, let's see, I have a picture of Thomas Young here. And uh, Young proposed that we had uh, different types of receptors in our eye that corresponded to different wavelengths of light. And another guy who we learned about previously, Hermann von Helmholtz, uh, added to this theory. And this is now known as Young-Helmholtz 
trichromatic theory. All right, and I forgot, here's a picture of Hermann von Helmholtz, who we saw before for his work on reaction times. Uh, but the young Helmholtz trichromatic theory said that we must have three different receptor types in order to see the different wavelengths that we're able to see. And so they proposed that we must have wavelengths that correspond to, uh, sorry, co receptors that correspond to shorter wavelengths of light, receptors that correspond to more medium wavelengths of visible light, and then receptors that correspond to longer wavelengths of light. And then by having these three receptors, any sort of light that we can see is just a combination of different patterns of activation of these three types. And these short are sometimes called, you'll sometimes see these called blue, uh, green, and red cone types. Uh, but uh, short, medium, and long is, is sort of a, a better terminology, and we'll see why in a second. Because it turns out Jung and, Jung and, and Helmholtz were thinking about this before we had any real knowledge of the types of cells in the retina. And it was it was a hundred years later before we could really find that we do actually have three different cone types in the retina. And then a few decades after that where we could find exactly how sensitive they were to different wavelengths of light. And so based on that, we have something that looks like this. So this shows that um, each of these uh, lines here represents a cone type and it shows the sort of the maximum sensitivity, the wavelength that it responds most intensely to, down to uh, lesser uh, response to different wavelengths. And so we see this, this would be the short cone here, this would be the medium here, and this would be the long. And the reason I said that the blue, green, and red labels aren't really that precise is because you'll, you'll notice that the red cone, the longer wavelengths, is actually peaks its sensitivity closer to a yellowish sort of orange color, rather than what we would think of as pure red. Okay, so the idea here is that any of the colors we see are a combination of activation of these three cone types. Right, so we can see here that yellow light is, is a equal parts of red and green light, and uh, or the, the wavelengths corresponding to red and green light, so the, the, the cones are equally activated at that point, and that's yellow. You can see you know, blue here at this peak, and a point that we'll come back to in the next video is that when someone's colorblind, um, you know, if, we, if we were to damage or remove one of these cone types, it's not the case that they just wouldn't see green anymore, for instance. It's that it would affect their perception of all these colors that overlap on the green cone, right? It would influence their perception of all sorts of other colors, you know, red and orange and yellow and green and a little bit of blues. Those would all be affected. And so we'll see that in the next video, um, and, and we'll go into more detail on color blindness. Okay, so that's the young Helmholtz trichromatic theory, this idea that we have three cone types and the combination of activation uh, of each of these three cone types gives us all the possible colors that we can see, which is, which is over a million different colors that we're able to see. And actually on a related note to that is the idea that this spectrum is not all the possible colors that we can see, right? It's also possible to have, you know, this is just the order of wavelengths. It's also possible to combine wavelengths in ways that aren't shown here. So we can combine red and blue light and we can see some colors that aren't actually appearing on this spectrum, but we can still see them. Okay, so... Um, there is something that isn't really explained by this trichromatic theory. You've probably seen something like this before. So if you stare at the center of this uh, flag image here, you know, and you stare for a few seconds, and you can pause the video if you want to stare longer, and then you switch your vision over to the uh, white background here, you'll see a red, white, and blue version of the American flag. So what's going on here? How do we explain this? It's not just that we have three cone types. Right? That seems to be insufficient. So we need an additional theory, which complements the trichromatic theory. And this is the opponent process theory. So opponent process theory was first proposed by a guy named Ewald Herring, who was a German physiologist, who we see here. And so Herring figured out that our color vision is actually working in pairs and that they oppose one another. They're sort of antagonistic. And that when you look at green, it actually inhibits red. Right? And if you look at red, it actually sort of inhibits green. And if you look at yellow, which is equal parts red and green, as we saw, that actually inhibits blue. And if you look at blue, that inhibits red and green equally, or yellow. So we have these two pairs of colors. We have 
you know, green and red are a pair that are opposing one another, and blue and yellow oppose one another. So the idea that that happens in opponent process theory is that when we stare at one color, we essentially tire out those receptors. Now, I don't really like saying they're tired out or they're fatigued. You can say they're habituated, uh, but I prefer to think of it as just saying that they're bored, right? So if you stare at green, initially the message that's being sent is green, 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 green. But the longer you stare at it, the, the firing rate slows down. It's like green, okay, like it's still green, green, green. So the firing rate gets reduced when you stare at that color for too long. Now, when you look at white light, and white light is all of the wavelengths at once, so we're seeing uh, equal parts of red and, and green and, and blue. When you switch your vision to the white light, what happens is now you're getting equal parts green and red, but the green is firing a little bit slowly, right? It's gotten bored, so it's not really paying attention. It's just a green, green, green. And now the red comes in and says red, 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 red. And so what happens is the red signal temporarily overpowers the green one. So instead of seeing equal parts, you appear to see more red than is actually there. And then eventually you adjust. And it takes only a few seconds. Uh, but the same thing can happen when you stare at uh, blue, is that the blue message sort of weakens. It's blue, blue, blue. Okay, blue, blue, blue. And then yellow comes in. Yellow, yellow, yellow. And suddenly you see yellow, even though it's actually equal parts, blue and yellow in the white background. All right, so that explains this um, color after image that we saw. And you can also have this color after image. It's not just with these neat pairs of red and green and blue and yellow. It happens to any colors in the spectrum. They all have an opposite color right? that would be seen in an after image. So if you take a photograph that has you know, many different colors in it and you invert all the colors, you show the opposite color. right? So everything you know, green becomes red, but any other shades as well all have an opposite. And if you stare at the opposite colors, and then you switch to a black and white version of the photograph, you'll temporarily see the photograph in its true colors. Right? So here's a demonstration of this. Now if you stare at the, uh, let's see, we'll have to wait for the uh, negative colors to come back. You're going to stare at the X here. I know that's hard to do. Um, and after a few seconds, it's going to switch back to black and white. And when it does that, you will temporarily see a sort of real color version of the photograph, even though that's not actually there. It's only the negative version and the black and white version. And another thing that uh, this shows, if you stare at the X and do this, is when the picture switches, if you let your eyes wander, you'll see that the illusion disappears. That's because you're only fatiguing or sort of boring those cells in that particular part of the retina. When you move your eyes, now that part of the picture is going to a different part of the retina and the effect doesn't work anymore. So you have to keep your vision focused on the same point. Uh, for this to work. Okay, so that's a negative color after image. Okay, in the next video I'll talk about color blindness in a little more detail and we'll see why this term color blindness is really a misleading term. People who are colorblind can see many colors, uh, but we'll talk about the different types of color blindness and what causes them in the next video. So I hope you found this helpful. If so, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. Thanks for watching.